Good evening, Honorable Deputy Speaker, members of Parliament, Excellencies, recipients of the Right Livelihood Award, dear friends, I stand before you today not just as an individual, but as a representative of suffering peoples in the oil fields of Nigeria and in oil fields around the world. I stand before you representing peoples oppressed and devastated by the unyielding claws of mineral and other resource extracting companies in the backwaters of the world. These people I represent may be faceless, but today, in all humility, I stand to salute their courage and to declare that the recognition of my struggles by the Right Livelihood Award Foundation is a clear recognition of the just cause of the resistance of the marginalized peoples who subsidize the world's insatiable loss for fossil fuels with their own blood and at the cost of their environment and means of livelihood. I stand on the shoulders of heroes of the struggles and recall at this time a very striking stanza of the national anthem of my country, Nigeria, which says, the labors of our heroes past shall never be in vain. I salute the courage of Ken Sarawiwa and all the other heroes who towed the non-violence resistance path and laid down their lives in the process. Their labors shall indeed not be in vain. With about 60% of the world's crude oil reserves already exhausted, it is stunning to see policymakers believing they can run into eternity on less than half a tank. The search for crude oil and other fossil fuels has meant increasing focus on fragile ecosystems, including offshore locations, nature reserves, and other protected areas. While the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change gathers the nations of the world to talk about how to tackle climate change, the real structural causes are scattered and unacknowledged. With the world running on the machines of competition and massive consumption, it is clear that we need more than one planet to meet humankind's appetites. It is also clear that for current levels of extraction, accumulation, and consumption, ethics have to be overthrown and impunity enthroned. It could not be otherwise because as the world seeks cheap energy, someone has to pay for it. With regard to the fossil fuel sector, those paying the price others enjoy are the communities on whose territories oil is found, the degraded environments, and of course, the global atmosphere. Last year, the Copenhagen Climate Conference ended up with an accord that was more like a cord lashed across bent backs of poor countries. Indeed, many were pressured to sign up or lose financial support. What will Cancun throw up? We're waiting to see at the end of this week. The drive to produce more and consume more continues to promote the release of more carbon into the atmosphere, leading to the climate crisis that the world is confronted with. The struggle to win the world of crude oil addiction has taken many forms and shapes. Recent milestones include the expulsion of Shell from Ogoniland in Nigeria in 1993, and the Yasuni ITT Reserve Project in Ecuador, where the government has proposed to leave this, the oil in the soil in exchange for half the value of that oil. And that value is 7.2 billion US dollars. In Africa, a growing movement of community activists are demanding that new oil be left in the soil to avoid the sort of scandalous environmental pollution and violent conflicts that the oil industry has hashed in Nigeria's Niger Delta. This demand is also being made as a direct pointer to the way climate change must be fought, cutting emissions at the source and sequestering the carbon where Mother Earth left it. The world was awakened to the polluting propensity of the oil industry by the Deepwater Horizon explosion and a company spill in April 2010 by BP. The massive scale of the accident 
and the attendant media focus made it impossible for the responsible corporation to shake responsibility. Contrast that with the case of the Niger Delta, where Shell claims that an incredible 98% of the pollution is caused by third parties, principally poor local people. The game of blaming the victim has been the style of the all multinationals operating in places such as the Niger Delta. And such blames have not always ended in the mass media. Some have led many to gross violence that have taken the lives of several people and sometimes decimation of communities. Climate crimes, environmental pollution, and other acts of impunity would not end as long as people believe they can assault Mother Earth and escape accountability. The preservation of the planet and the enjoyment of fundamental human as well as socioeconomic rights would not be attainable until and unless the rights of Mother Earth are respected. It is with this understanding that we applaud Ecuador for having already enshrined the rights of Mother Earth in their constitution. And indeed, about a week ago, I, along with other eco defenders from around the world, sued BP, the Constitutional Court of Ecuador, for harm to nature in the deep sea horizon oil spill. At the moment, a proposal is before the United Nations to bring into existence the Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. Such rights would not be easy to attain in a world where relations are built or destroyed on the altar of competition and rapacious exploitation. It will take a change of heart on the part of humans to understand that just as we have rights, so does the Earth. Sustainable development will remain a mere phrase as long as people see sustainability as merely relevant to keeping their prof profit margins on the rise. It is time for global recognition that any harm inflicted on the planet directly corresponds to throwing the future of every inhabitant of the planet into jeopardy. Climate change is a clear manifestation of what can happen when a mode of civilization is driven by factors that are clearly destructive. The fossil fuels driven civilization has driven humanity to the brink, often termed the keep it tipping point with regard to the climate crisis. The time has come for action to be taken to reverse the trend. The time has come for the world to look away from the carbon driven development part and its governing mentality. It is time to end carbon offsetting and carbon speculations as solutions to climate change. We have to see trees for what they are and not pretend that they are nothing more than carbon stocks. The false solutions being paraded at the conference of the parties going on at Cancun can get as shocking as when organized climate crimes are rewarded with carbon credits and cash. An, ins an insulting example is one where the World Bank plans to extend support from the carbon trade route to gas flare projects in the Niger Delta. The unethical base of this scam can be seen in the fact that gas flaring has been an illegal act in Nigeria since 1984. And there's no way the halting of an illegal activity should end carbon credits, except if the entire carbon trade bazaar is a scam. It is time to say no to the pretense that agrofuels can replace fossil fuels or that they are renewable and green when it is clear that they are not. The focus on agrofuels has led to massive land grabs in Africa. This has meant marginalization of the poor, pressures on food supplies, diversion of land from food crop production, deforestation, and abuse of human rights, to mention just a few. It has also been seen by the biotech industry as a crack in the door, allowing them to introduce genetically engineered crops where such would ordinarily be resisted and rejected. It is time to establish an international climate crimes tribunal as proposed by the People's Agreement, drawn up in April 2010 at Cochabamba, Bolivia. Such a tribunal would function in a way comparable to the International Court of Justice, where crimes against humanity are tried. The Climate Crimes Tribunal would try any sort of environmental crime that harms Mother Earth and does the right of the people to a safe environment. This would be seen as crimes against humanity. 
culprits to be tried would include polluters such as those in the extractive industry. It would also put corporations as well as their directors in the dock for climate and environmental crimes, which are in effect crimes against humanity. Permit me at this point to remember a man who fought courageously against environmental damage by a dangerous machinery of state and the corporations. Ken Sarawiwa, who received the Right Livelihood Award in 1994, a year before he was hanged by the military that was in power in Nigeria then. He stood for nonviolent resistance to erosion of environmental rights and sociopolitical justice. Although he lost his life at the hands of undemocratic forces, the party charted remains the only way viable, the only viable option and way out of the Niger Delta quagmire. I salute the courage of all those who tow this path for the resolution of conflict. I salute the suffering communities and peoples resisting destructive extraction. It is their courage that sustains our struggle. In solidarity, we march ahead and we will not give up. Thank you very much.